All right, church, today I want to spend some time talking about hunger. And yes, hunger of the belly, but also the soul hunger that all of us experience in our life as we try to figure out uh, how God is leading us, informing us, and shaping us as God's people. And so I start with a story about Yankel. Yankel was a young Jewish man, uh, was running a successful bakery, but yes, the Germans came that night and they rounded up all of those Jewish folks and they put them on a train car and they locked that train car and as so often was the case, that train car sat there for several days uh, waiting to be sent out to Auschwitz. And there in that space, Yanko looked across uh, from him and he saw this older gentleman who was once very proud, uh, distinguished, uh, well-respected in his village but not now. He looked hungry. He was in pain. He was suffering. His eyes were sunken in. And so that night, Yanko got up from the spot he was sitting and he went over next to this man and he put his arms around him and he began to warm him, rubbing his arms and his legs and his chest and his back, his hands and his feet. And all night long, Yanko worked to keep this man alive. And in the morning, as the sun became to, began to come up and the, the rays shone through the train car, just a bit of warmth, Yanko looked around that car to discover that everyone else in that train car that night had passed away from the deep cold. And so he looked out into the crowd that he was speaking and he said, you know why I'm alive today? Because when you warm other people's lives, you warm your own. When you warm other people's hearts, you actually warm your own. When you work with inspiration to support and encourage and inspire others, then you discover support and encouragement and inspiration for your own life as well. And he said, folks, that's the secret of Judaism 101. That's the story out of which all of us are called to live. Well, I don't know about you, but I want to be like that young man, Yankel. And I want to spend my life warming others. Because in so doing as the church, I know that I myself will discover that life that God has intended. That soul hunger that I feel that will be met by God. Well, I'm here to tell you that all world religions have this concept or this teaching or this base belief that you are to go out and you are to love neighbor. And when you're loving the neighbor and making an impact and loving and serving and giving, you're bringing life to the world. It's a beautiful vision. And I know this congregation has been doing that all along. You see, I think God knew what God was doing years ago when God called you together and gave you the name Grace. Your grace, right? Yeah, shake your heads or do something. Yeah, <laughs> your name is grace. And the root of grace, one of the forms of that is this, this Greek word charis. Charis is gift, gratitude, generosity. And we see this in Jesus, do we not? We see that abundance of grace as he taught and as he lived and as he poured out life. As he was hung up on that cross and mocked and ridiculed, he did not look down with spite or anger or rage. He continued to pour out life and love. And even when we took his body and laid him in a cold, dark tomb, he came back, not again with, I'm here to, to prove a point that, that I will get you for what you've done. No, he, he looked upon the world and the disciples and said, I'm here to show you that life and love is going to win. My grace will be sufficient for you. And because we have that gift of grace, that gift of grace, we have gratitude in our heart. And it calls us out in all the moments and intersections of life to live with a spirit of generosity. Again, we keep our hearts warm by warming others' hearts. We find our life by pouring it out. We discover meaning and purpose as we give. Well, St. Augustine had a great phrase that he would say. He said, our hearts are restless until we find our rest in God. And I believe this to be true. 
I believe that with everything, that that is so true. We're searching, and we're looking, and we're wondering, and when we discover more of who God is, this God of Jesus, we become more alive. But we're restless, and we're constantly trying to figure it out. And the world sells us a bunch of lies or, or a bag of goods that doesn't necessarily work. Uh, one of those is this great company, Amazon. Now, I'm not picking on Amazon. Don't hear that. I love Amazon. Matter of fact, we lived here two days, and we had ordered some stuff. And, and I look out my window at our house, and there's this BMW sitting, this brand-new BMW sitting in our driveway. The trunk is open, and this young man is taking out our Amazon boxes. And I'm like, wow, this is better than the UPS guy. Um, <laughs> But apparently Amazon sometimes uses Uber drivers to deliver your goods. And I'm like, man, this, th these people know how to deliver. But when I go over to Kent and I drive by that fulfillment center, I just get a smile on my face because of that word fulfillment. Yes, I know Amazon fulfills our wishes and our needs and our, our laundry list of things. But fulfillment, church, is never going to come by what we own, by the stuff that we buy. Uh, us human beings, we're fickle people, are we not? We dream and we want a brand new car and we buy the brand new car and then when the new car smell starts to wear off, we're like, time for an upgrade, right? Uh, our world is filled with storage units and we rent and we take our, our hard-earned money and, and we, we pay for a storage unit to put stuff in there that we won't even see hardly for the course of the year and sometimes we even forget that we owned it. And when it's stored up and it's under lock and key, it can't be used for anything. It doesn't really bless anything, but yet it's a resource right there in front of us. So the things of the world won't fill us up, but what will? Well, I think we find our rest in God when we are loving and when we are serving and when we're giving. It's amazing the joy that people discover and the stories that are told when you talk about the people that you met or the stories of the other as you sat there loving and serving. It brings you more to life. We find our rest in God when we're living with a mindset of abundance versus a mindset of scarcity. When we walk around saying, yes, there's plenty, the world has enough, and we're the conduit or the delivery system to help bring that about, but if we sit there and say, no, there'll never be enough, or I'll never have enough, I won't be enough, then you live closed off instead of open to what God might do. And again, like that story stone soup, there's plenty when all come together to make life possible. Another one we find our rest in God is when we are satisfying hungry stomachs and hungry souls. Isn't it amazing when you sit with somebody and you share a meal, there's more than the food, right? There's love and, and there's laughter and there's story that is shared. That's why world hunger here has been such a meaningful impact. You, Grace, have actually kept people alive. Do you understand that? When you give to world hunger, there are people living in the world today. There are generations that have been born since you started this work in 1975. Can you say, wow, God? I mean, that's an amazing thing to think about. And you'll never even see those folks, but they're there. And they're alive and well because you warmed them with your life. We find our rest in God when we align the resources that God has given us with our greatest faith, faith passion. I love getting to be a pastor and I love sitting with you and hearing your dreams and your passions and what it is that you care about. As a matter of fact, when we stand up and do announcements, we're simply telling your story. Here's what you love and here's how you can continue to make that impact. And when I get to sit with you and say, if you'd like to give to that, you're coming more alive because again, you're in alignment with what God has created you for. And it's amazing the stories there that can be told. And we find our rest in God when we're warming hearts all along life's way because we bring life to all. It's why we say here at Grace that all are welcome to God's table because all will be fed, all will be raised up. And what a beautiful vision for the world. And so this gospel story today in Luke, a, a great story and it, it kind of convicts us. It comes to us and it holds us in the midst of God's story. Do you know that right now, your very life is being demanded of you? Right where you sit, in the pew that you find yourself, wherever you are on life's journey, right now, your life is being demanded of you. That's the story of this young man. You see, he had the gift of life. He woke up, his feet hit the floor, he was breathing, smiling, laughing, and he was living the dream. You all living the dream? 
<laughs> we're living the dream. We're here. We're here. We're on this side of the grass, right? You got life. And yet this young man had so much. The bumper crop, the abundance in his life had so been poured out, he was sitting around thinking, hmm, what should I do? And his dream was, I'm just going to rip down all this stuff that I got, and I'm going to upsize. I'm going to mega size everything. And when I get that done, then I'm going to pop my popcorn and grab my beer or my uh, sangria. I'm going to kick the lazy boy up, put the popcorn right here on my belly with the remote, and just sit back and chill. That, that's what's in the Gospel of Luke. Didn't you see that? That's, that's the story. He says, it's well with my soul. And God says, no, 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 dude, you're missing it. You're missing it. You got an opportunity. Take what God has given you and figure out how to put that to work because you will be alive then. To live any other way, you're participating in death or loss. You're not bringing the world to life. Well, Mary Oliver, in one of her poems, I think it was called, uh, one of the titles is Grasshopper. She has this phrase that has always grabbed me by the gut. It's like stuck in my brain and it filters through my mind several times every day for whatever reason. I just love, I love the conviction and the passion of the question. She asks, tell me what you will do with your one wild and precious life. We all get to go around just once. I mean, we get second chances, third chances, but last time, I'm only gonna be born like this once. I only get to show up like this once. And some people will live to be well into their hundreds and, and others of us won't make it that long and we don't understand why those things work the way they do, the stories of those who've gone before us, but we know with the life we've been given, we really want it to bring life, to be life. And that's why I love the words from 1 Timothy 6 today because at the end of that reading, he gives us an intention, a purpose for how we can live with what we have. He said, do good, be rich in good works, be generous and be ready to share. Why? Or better yet, so that you can really live the life that is life, that you can pour out that life that is so powerful to seize upon that. And church, this is what it means to be rich to live the life that really is life, to be good, to do good, to be generous and ready to share. And I love it when you discover that and when you know that in your life. Well, one of those other lies the world may tell us, just like with our stuff, if I just surround myself with stuff, I'll be happy. But we know that's just the sugar high. Another lie that the world will tell us is that I'm supposed to be independent, that I should be able to make it on my own, that I can simply do what I need to do by myself. It's a lie. Jesus came to show us that we don't have a declaration of independence, that there is a declaration of interdependence, and that I need you, and you need me, and we together, knit together as the body of Christ, we're able to accomplish abundantly far more than we could ever ask for or imagine. It's done in community. Amen? So that is part of the declaration of hope, and that only happens when we live with generous lives. Generosity, giving of time and talent of treasure is one of those great declarations of hope for the world. I learned this in the church. I don't know about you, but the church was always the foundation for teaching me these stories of Jesus and what life is to really look like and how we can love and serve one another. It was from sitting in a pew every single week, and back then, uh, it was every single week. We did not miss uh, worship. It's maybe why I became a pastor. I'm not sure. Um, But I would sit there in the pew, and if I ever got out of line, my mom would pinch me on my leg uh, right here. I I can't grow hair right there on my leg because I was was pinched so much, you know? Um, But but I was was a fidgety kid. Um, But sitting there and hearing the story and gathering around table, There were so many blessings, and the relationships were so rewarding. It just was a joy uh, to live in community. Well, as part of that church, uh, Spring Valley Lutheran Church, a little hillside, uh, four miles away from our farm in South Dakota, uh, my dad uh, taught me about generosity and about life. You know, life for us wasn't easy. Uh, We grew up in, in abject poverty. And the cool thing is when you're a little kid, you're kind of clueless. You have no idea, right? Life is just going along. You really don't know. But then as you begin to grow up, you start connecting the dots a little bit. And, and yeah, there were times when there was no electricity. And there were times when the water 
uh, was shut off. And there were times where there was meat in the deep freezer, and then there were other seasons where there was nothing in the deep freezer, and we just had to go to the store when we could to buy what we needed at the time. Well, every single week as we gathered in church, my dad would reach into his wallet, and he'd pull out a 5 or a 10 or a 50, whatever it is that he had, and he'd hand it to one of us kids. And we were expected to put it in the plate. Sometimes I wanted to rip off a third of a 50 and just, you know, kind of keep it. Doesn't work that way, does it? No, it would have been no good. But I was tempted. I was tempted. You see, we had seasons of life. I I remember when our car got repossessed and the sheriff knocked on our door and and, and the tow truck was there and my mom was in a fit of anger at that moment. So she took the keys and she chucked them as far as she could out into the yard. Um, Said, if you're going to take it, good luck finding the keys, right? Um, So these stories are, are, are planted deep. But again, even in the midst of challenge, My dad was teaching me, just like this young man, Yankel, to keep your own heart warm by warming someone else's heart. You find your life by giving it, not holding back, not stopping, not quitting, but pouring it out, being generous. Well, the ministries of grace, again, all that's done here is meant to do that. It's meant to provide life there, but it's meant to bring you to full life so that you don't miss out on living the life that really is life. And Pastor John, today you were doing a presentation at the Pace Hour and you put up the slogan of Malawi, which our world hunger is all about. And what was the slogan? Something about warm, a warm, a warm, the warm heart of Africa. I had no idea that was their slogan when I wrote this sermon, but I thought that was fascinating. We're giving this year in world hunger to Malawi, the warm heart of Africa. When we give to them, we're giving to us. And we're figuring out, again, how to be deeper, better, more alive in Jesus. And so this is a season when we we give to that, we pay particular attention, we focus on our year in giving, we, we dream about what God is calling us to next year. And as you pray about that, as you align your resources with those areas of passion, may you be blessed and may you become more alive. And so will you pray this generosity prayer with me that's up on the screen? Do whatever it takes, Lord Jesus, to bring the world and all of us to full life. Enliven us to warm others' hearts and in turn warm our very own. May generous, responsive hearts reside within each of us and may a resurrection witness be our legacy. Amen. It's a big prayer. Well, my dad, uh, when I was going off to college, uh, wasn't able to help. Mom and dad said, son, we got your back. We're going to pray for you. We, we want you to go do that. Uh, we're here, but, but we can't help. We don't have the resource. And I said, that's all right. Uh, we're doing life together. And Um, I remember packing up my old 76 Mustang, an old jalopy of a vehicle. We crammed in as much stuff as I could fit in to head off to college that day, and the the hatchback didn't latch shut. So as you drove down a gravel road or the old highway, it just kind of bounced all along the way, you know? It was my base, all about the base, all about the base. Anyways. um, (laughs) And so I remember the tears that we shared and the hugs as I got in my car to leave. And meaningful time, again, of being sent, again, equipped with what parents had given me. And I drove about uh, an hour and a half, and I got to Sioux City, Iowa, and I had to stop to to gas up my car, because that thing was a gas guzzler. And I opened up my gas lid, and right there uh, was a note from my dad, along with two $20 bills. And the note just simply expressed that he was proud of me, but then he said, I want to give this to you, Sue. It's a small gift, but I want you to get to where you're going. Folks, that's the heart of generosity. That when you give, you're helping people get to where they're going. And sometimes it's a few slices of bread, and other times it's meant to meet soul hunger, to give us God. So keep being who you are. Keep doing what you do and keep discovering the life 
that really is life in Jesus. And God's people say, Amen. Thanks for watching. I hope this video can further the discussion of your relationship with Christ, either at home or maybe in the comments below.